Praise the Lord. I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Amen. Second Peter chapter two. <clears throat> Praise God. I'd like to say thank you for coming to the house of the Lord. May the Lord richly bless you. Second Peter chapter two and beginning in verse one. If you found that place, say amen. amen. But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately or privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. I believe that's the day we're living in. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, let, let me pause right here. Um, may, maybe not every one of you have ever read this, but this is what happened to the angels that was cast out of heaven who lost their first state. You know, I, I, I'm not one to beat a dead horse, but the more I read this Bible here, the more I realize how, how wrong the doctrine of eternal security is. If God spared not the angels, why in the world would he spare us? You know what I'm saying? I mean, if the angels who had already were in that celestial city, if they were not able to maintain their status because they turned against God, what in the world is going to happen to people on this earth to turn against God? Amen? Let me read that one more time. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Now, see, that's why we preach about righteousness. That's why we preach about holiness. That's why we preach about a sanctified and consecrated lifestyle. It's because we don't want to wind up like that antediluvian age that drowned in the flood of God's judgment. We don't want to wind up like the people in Sodom and Gomorrah that God rained down fire and brimstone on. We don't want to wind up like the angels that once lived in the heavenly worlds but was cast out of heaven and at the command of God was chained and cast into a lake of fire into everlasting darkness. We don't want to be like that. Amen? You know, I wish that we could just live any old kind of way and go to heaven and wouldn't have no fussle and no hassle and, you know, there was no restrictions. You just kind of live like you want to go and God loved everybody and everybody wound up in heaven. But that you can't read this Bible and get that out of this. Amen? And when we realize this, we, we, we find out that only the pure in heart shall see the Lord. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Amen? That's the only one that's going to ascend into that holy hill. Amen? 
That's why we preach against sin. That's why sin's still ugly. It's still black. It's still dirty. It's still nasty. And that's why we, pr- we cry out against it. Because if you die with sin in your heart, you're going to hell. Now that's, I mean, that's hard. That's just frank. And that's, but it's the truth. If God spared not his own angels, you don't have any special favor in the eyes of God either. I don't either. Amen? So, you know, people that tell you, well, I read the Bible and all I read is God's love and he loves everybody and that's the gist of it. That's somebody that that ain't reading the whole book. Well, I want to read on here. But verse 7 said, and he delivered just Lot. Not only did he bring judgment and fire upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, not only is he a God of judgment, but he knows how to deliver people. Amen? And he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Verse 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. This man, with seeing and with hearing, it vexed his heart. I mean, it caused Lot to almost be destroyed in that city with the wicked. And that way we go back to that little song, Sister Marie, that we sing with the children. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. You know why? Because it can vex your soul. What goes in your ears and what goes in your eyes matters. Let me say that one more time. What goes in your ears and what goes in your eyes, it matters. Amen? But here's what I want to I, I, I preach tonight. I, I feel like I need to preach from verse 9. A wonderful, a wonderful passage of Scripture right in the midst of God uh, inspiring the Apostle Peter to talk about how that he judges the wicked and how the wicked fall under the condemnation of an almighty God. Yet he says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation." I said the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. You know, it's God that is preserving the unjust. A lot of times we look and we say, how in the world is that wicked man being preserved? Or how in the world is he faring so good? God's just allowing him to get by for a little while. Amen? He's preserving him. But I'm glad that God knows how to take care of of his own. Amen. He's preserving the wicked until the day of judgment, but he's preserving the saints of God that we might inherit our mansion. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad that God knows how to take care of his own. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God. The same God that drowned in all of that antediluvian age, the same God that chunked those disobedient angels out of heaven, the same God that rained down fire and judgment upon those homosexuals in Sodom and Gomorrah, that same hand uh, that wrought wicked or judgment, and I mean great and mighty judgment, I mean that same God knows how to cradle you in the palm of his hand. He knows how to place you in the cleft of the rock and he knows how to shield you in an awful and a sinful day that we live hallelujah to God praise God glory to God amen I'd like to preach just a little while on God knows how to deliver amen glory to God (laughs) oh yeah glory to God I mean look here I know your problems and my problems they seem so great, but the Solomon, the, re- the great writer Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm telling you, you're not facing anything that somebody else hadn't already faced. And let's, let me put it in slang terms right here. This isn't God's first rodeo. A lot of times we walk up on a job and say, that ain't my first rodeo. This ain't God's first rodeo. And he knows how to deliver people. I mean, he's 
been around the block a few times uh, and he knows where you are and he knows what you have need of and he knows how to deliver you. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> Woo! I said we are not resting in our own ingenuity. We're, we're not trusting in our own hands of flesh. I said we're leaning back in the arms of God. The God that said the battle is not yours, but it is the Lord's. Hallelujah. I'm glad I don't have to take care of myself, but I'm glad God knows how to take care of me in this wicked and perverse world. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Glory to God. Notice, let me say this. In 2 Chronicles chapter 10, the Bible said, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And what I see in here, Sister Bonnet, the fact that the weapons of our warfare now, I, I, like, I like the way the Apostle Paul coins that. We are in a warfare. I, I made mention of this this morning. And when you are in a warfare, I mean, there, there's tactics to that warfare. There's some of those enemies, they will encamp a city, Brother Eddie. I mean, they'll cut off all supplies. They'll besiege that city, and they'll starve it out. I mean, there's times in this Bible here, Elijah there was in the camp, Elijah, Elisha, uh, where the two lepers sat at the, the gate of the city or the four lepers uh, and fleeing from me. But I know there was a time that they were encamped. I mean, the enemy, that was the tactics of war. There's times that we just bombard before we go into the, uh, the on D-Day, before we went on the coast there, attacking journey. They bombed and bombed and bombed. It was just the way, it was the tactics of war. And Notice the Apostle Paul said, for our warfare is not carnal. We are in a battle. The devil, he's at the drawing board. He's devising a plan that will cause you to backslide. He's devising a plan that will cause me to get discouraged, that will cause me to get depressed. He knows, he knows my weaknesses, but I'm glad that the God of heaven, he knows my weaknesses, and he's able to help me in this time of trouble. Amen. Glory to God. I believe that. You know, sometimes we just can't look behind the curtain. We, we just get this idea that we're floating on the sea of life all alone, no help. I mean, we're just floundering around, no trouble. Man, I mean, God, he is a deliverer. I said we are the children of God. We are his sons and daughters, and he cares that I make it to heaven. He said, have I any pleasure that the wicked should perish? Ladies and gentlemen, God don't want you to go to hell. He's not standing over you with a bat ready to drive you into hell. He wants us to get on these altars and pray. He wants us to be full of the Holy Ghost. He wants us to enter in to that city he's prepared for us. Amen. That's right. Glory to God. But we are in a warfare. And this verse tells us that Satan's going to use tactics. He's going to use whatever he can. He's an opportunist. If you get discouraged easy, he's going to discourage you. Amen? I mean, maybe if you got a short fuse and you blow up quick, he's going to push you just a little bit too far to try to get you to blow up and cause you, I mean, cause you to say something you shouldn't say. Amen? That's right. If you've got a tendency uh, to, to, to be worldly, I mean, he's going to push you to the edge. Or, I mean, if you've got a tendency to be unfaithful to God, he's going to give you every excuse in the world to be unfaithful to God. He's an opportunist. He knows you, and he's going to destroy you any way he can. Glory to God. And one of the main ways he does that, he separates you. A lot of times, first thing people will do, man, they get all sideways and crossways, and, and the first thing they want to do is leave church. Because if the devil can get you separated from the body of Christ. I mean, there's power in numbers. 
You hear me? That's power. When a brother will put his arm around you, a sister will put his arm around you and say, hey, man, you can make it and encourage. We, we know we're supposed to encourage one another. We're supposed to pray one for another. But I tell you, man, that old line, if you notice, man, when he charges that, that herd on the, on the wilderness out there, what does he do? Whichever one of those little calves gets isolated and runs off by itself, that's the one that line goes after. Oh, yeah. And that's the way it is with the devil. He wants to get you out of church. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. He wants you out of church because he wants to kill you. But I tell you, that's why the Bible said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together in the house of the Lord. Even so, when you see the end coming, why there's strength in the house of God. Amen. When we pray one for another, it helps one another. What a God, and if he can get you isolated, if he can get you crossed up with a brother or sister, and he can get you discouraged enough you don't come back, that's good as he wants. If he can get you out the herd, because the banana that leads to bunch is usually the one that gets skint. Amen? Lord of God, and I didn't say there's salvation in this church or this body. The salvation comes through Jesus Christ. But we are supposed to be his sons and daughters. We are supposed to be the family of God. And like they say, blood thicker than water. And fathers and mothers, when your children get in trouble, you run to their rescue. Amen. You might not condone what they're doing. You not, might not be happy about what, but when they cry out and they say, Daddy, uh, Mama, I'm in trouble and I need help. You might even look at them and say, I don't, I don't agree with what you're doing, but you know what? You'll try to help them, and that's the way God is. I'm telling you, God, he's that very high tower. He's that help in the time of trouble. I said, that's why we cry, Abba, Father. He is our heavenly Father, and he cares for us tonight. Hallelujah. Lord of God. I'd like to just a few more minutes elaborate on that first line. The Lord knoweth how to deliver. God knows how to deliver you. That's probably been a thousand times in my life, I reckon, Sister Bonnet, that I say, I don't know. I, I don't know situations and problems that I face. Brother Nathaniel, I say, I just don't know. But I'm telling you, God knows how to deliver you. There's a lot of times we toss up this idea and we say, wonder if this will work. And we toss up that idea. No, I wonder if that will work. God don't have to look at the best of three options. There's only one God knows what needs to be done in your life. And he knows where you are. He knows the powerful grip that the devil has on you. He knows what your situation is. And I said, God knows how to deliver you. And that's why we need to run unto him, Brother Albert. That's why we need to get to God and stay in the arms of God. He knows how to deliver us. Amen. Lord of God. Hallelujah. Notice God knows how to deliver families. I mean, you, you could really plug this in with a thousand things. Because God knows it all about all. Amen. But you know, our families... We've been in the Sunday school class back here, the young couples and the young married class. And, and, you know, there's a lot of problems out there. You know, the devil attacks the family. This church here is really no stronger than the families that come here. And before God ever instituted the church, he instituted the family. And that's why there's such an attack on the family. We, they come up with this idea that one parent's just as good as two. Don't believe that lie. Let me say that one more time. I said our, our, our philosophers and our, our school teachers and, and, and our, our, our leaders in Washington tell us that one parent is just as good as two. I say that's hogwash. In every family there needs to be a man and there needs to be a woman. And they don't need to be two men living together raising a child and they don't need to be two women living together raising a child. You're distorting the order of God. 
There needs to be that tender touch of a loving mama and there needs to be that disciplining hand of that father. God did that. You say, I don't like the program. I tell you, God come up with the program and you can like it or lump it. He didn't give you an option to weigh in on the matter. He said, this is how it's going to be. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, praise God. Glory to God. I'm feeling kind of dangerous. Glory to God. God knows how to deliver our families. And notice, you remember that marriage at Cana. You remember one of the first miracles that God ever did. It was, it was related to a marriage, to a family. You know, God's concerned about families. Amen. God's concerned about that wedding, uh, that marriage at, at Canaan there. But notice the first thing that I noticed there is they invited Jesus to the marriage. You know, if you're having marital problems, first thing you need to do is invite Jesus into your marriage. Amen? I'm talking about if the Lord's going to deliver you, you got to at least let Him in your life. Amen? You can't ask Him to deliver you if you don't serve Him. Amen? I know so many people, man, I mean, they just say, well, I love the Lord. And they live in the old kind of sloppy way. And they don't go to church. They don't, I mean, they don't read the Bible. And then time they get in the gym, it's, oh, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Hogwash, man. If you love the Lord, you'd be in the house of God. If you love the Lord, you'd pray. If you love the Lord, you'd read His Word. Amen. Lord of God. So if we want the Lord to deliver us and help us, we got to invite him into our lives and into our families and into our homes. Amen? Notice the second thing at that marriage supper of Canaan. They asked him to help with the problem. They ran out of wine at the marriage supper and Jesus didn't just barge in and say, I'll fix this here, hand me the wrench. No, he didn't. He waited for them to ask him to fix the problem. If you've got problems, have you really asked Jesus to fix them? A lot of times we wait till the last, God's the last person that we embark upon. I mean, we try to get help from here. We try to get ourselves in a jam, go to the banker, go to the doctor, go to grandma, go to grandpa, and God's the last on the list. I said if he's our heavenly father, brother, ever, that ought to be the first place we go. But notice, they invited him to the marriage supper, amen. Then they asked him for his help. Notice the third thing that they did. They obeyed the Lord's instruction to solve the problem. <laughs> when he told them to go get them pots of water, they obeyed the Lord. I said there was labor involved. There was obedience involved. They went and filled those pots full. It's still water when they dipped them out the well. But they obeyed the Lord. There are a lot of, lot, lot of families, a lot of families in trouble. Now, I mean, look, look here. Let, just let me tell you this. There's people that's come to this church right here and they've met with me in private and they've talked with me personally and I'm not going to call any names. But look here, they want to live in the bar room. They want to drink their booze and blow their cigarette smoke and they want to come up here and play gospel music on Sunday after they partied on Saturday night and call themselves a Christian. I'm telling you, that dog ain't going to hunt while I'm here. Amen. Amen. Now, look here, I know we all struggle. I know there's times, look here, at our best efforts, we fail. But look here, that just ain't right. Now, I'm telling you, that ain't right. I mean, look here, if you can swing from a bar room on Saturday night and curse and swear and blow smoke uh, and shoot the breeze and curse and, and, and live any old kind of way and come and sing about Jesus on Sunday, then I just will throw that Bible in a trash can and live like everybody else. But I'm telling you, I don't believe that's right. I believe you've got to come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. There's a way called holiness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And I told him just as nice as I could. I said, if you get saved and, and you come out from among sin and you stop sinning, you get out of the sinning business, we'll be glad to let you up here. Amen. But it's amazing to me how slack 
people want to live and still call themselves Christians. You know, if you're going to continue living the way you was living before you got saved, what did God save you from? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. For how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We were saved from sin. and We are to continue to live apart from sin. Amen. Glory to God. God knows how to deliver families. God know, now I, I'm just preaching to you about those first few words. The Lord knoweth how to deliver. I mean, there's times that, that I don't know what to do, but God does. Amen. The Lord, we live in some awful days, church. I, I know the message that I preach is not very popular. There's a lot more uh, ecumenical type um, message and a more a softer and just a, a, a non-offensive message. I understand that. I'm not crazy. I hear other preachers, uh, but I'm telling you, we're living in dark days. I believe we're living in days uh, where sin is coming in like a flood. And man, sin's always on sale. I mean, it all, it's right at the punch of a button. Everywhere you look, there's just ungodliness everywhere around us. Uh, and it's closing in on the church. Uh, and I want us to be ready. I don't want us to be contaminated. I don't want us to be found unworthy when we stand before the Lord. But God knows how to deliver us. Uh, even in this wicked age that we live, uh, God knows how to keep us, uh, keep our foot from slipping. Uh, he knows how to preserve us. Until the day of judgment. Hallelujah to God. Praise the Lord. Amen. In a day that sin abounds, God knows how to deliver us. Amen. I mean, ever, everywhere you look, man, it's not that you got, I mean, just everywhere you look, there's just, I mean, opportunity. Sin is always on sale. It's kind of like my wife, man. I mean, she goes shopping, man. It, it, it don't matter what Saturday it is, man. Go downtown. She say, you ain't going to believe this. I say, what? I'm on the phone. She said, they're having a big sale. I say, no. Nah. That's the way it was last Saturday and the Saturday before. And the Saturday before that, there's always a big sale because they know them women's not working and they're going to be shopping, amen. And so they'd take a $50 dress, mark it up to 100 scratch through the 100 and say $50 off or half price and you're paying $50 anyhow. And you got that woman standing there with them eyes and say, it's a half price. <laughs> Sounds like I ain't the only one that's experienced that rodeo, amen. <laughs> but sin is always on sale yeah. it ain't just Saturday Monday morning Monday afternoon Tuesday Tuesday afternoon I'm telling you man our young people you wouldn't believe the, the nudity of them taking pictures and texting um, those pictures to one another I mean just at the touch of a, they ain't got to be in the privacy of their home they can just have that uh, uh, that smartphone and man they pull up all kind of pornography it's right at our fingertips and young people mama can't always be there to watch you daddy can't always be there to watch you but you better run for safety you better shun the devil you better cry out to God and pray that you don't enter in to everlasting judgment praise God it's everywhere these corruptible days that we're living in, sin is on every corner. And if the devil can't get you one way, he'll get you another. But I'm preaching to you that the Lord knows how 
to deliver you. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. God's not up in heaven scratching his head saying, what in the world am I going to do now that they've come out with the internet? What am I going to do now that they've come out with smartphones? What am I going to do now that they've opened the new uh, gentleman's club? Now, no, no, no. I'm telling you, God, he already knows uh, and he knows how to deliver you. If you're willing to run to him, uh, I tell you, God's got a fence uh, that the devil can't break through. <laughs> God's got a fence that the enemy can't penetrate. Hallelujah. Woo! That fence of sanctification. Glory to God. Woo! Hallelujah. That's why we believe you ought to be sanctified. After that you get saved, salvation's good. But sanctification will build a fence. It'll help you keep the enemy out of your life. Amen. Glory to God. Well, praise the Lord. Notice, God knows how to deliver us from past mistakes. Sometimes that's the worst mistakes in the world. Trying to get over failures that we have had in our lives. And when we don't know what to do, those voices, those memories, those flashbacks of what we've done, God knows how to deliver you from that. Hallelujah to God. We've all made mistakes. We've all messed up in our past. Every one of us in this building has got skeletons in our closet. You know, a lot of people feel like that's their calling to go around and unlock closets and pull people's skeletons out. You know, that didn't never help the kingdom of God. Now, I believe if somebody's getting up and I believe somebody's preaching, I believe somebody's in the church, I, I believe, look here, I, I read to you, I believe that church of Ephesus or, or church of uh, maybe Sardis or Smyrna, how they tried them that said they were apostles and they found them to be liars. Come on now. Amen? Amen? I mean, hey, look here, I believe you ought to be able to check somebody out. If they ain't living right, they don't need to be teaching your children. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. He knows how to deliver us from our past mistakes. The Apostle Peter in that garden with Jesus. The Bible said after Jesus had prayed that third time that there came the servants of the high priest and one of those servants was Malchus. And the Bible said in Malchus, after that Judas kissed Jesus to betray him, Malchus and those went to bind him. And the apostle Peter took that sword. The apostle Peter was going to kill that boy. A lot of times we say, well, he just cut his ear off. He just played. No, 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 no. The apostle Peter was going for blood. He was going for that man's life. And I believe when the apostle Peter come down with that sword, that man ducked like that and he got his ear. He was going to kill him. But you know, Malchus ought not have been there to start with. Now, I'm, wait a minute. I'll get to Apostle Peter in just a second. Well, let's take them as they come. Malchus shouldn't have never been there trying to arrest the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's a lot of times people get in trouble when they're in the wrong place. Malchus didn't have no business there, Brother Tyrone. He was walking on dangerous ground. Let me tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. I know I sound like I'm, I wasn't really planning on doing that. I sound like I come in here beating and framing and pounding. But I'm telling you right now, I heard a lot of uh, preachers talking about they have beach ministries. And stuff. Let me tell you something, man. You don't need to be down there at that beach while it's hot. You don't need to be down there at that beach while it's hot. That's right. Amen. I am fully convinced, Sister Bonnet, you can throw me out tonight if you want. I'm fully convinced God is not going to rapture not one woman off of Myrtle Beach with a bikini on when he comes back. Not one. And he's not going to rapture not one man down there lusting over him either. Not one. Now, I'm fully convinced of that. I believe that. And if I'm wrong and they get to heaven, well, I'll just shout up there in heaven when it won't matter up there. Amen? But I just believe that that is not becoming holiness. 
I believe it's important for God, to God, for us to wear clothes. If it wasn't, when that man come running out of those tombs naked, the Bible said he was found at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Jesus clothed Adam and Eve in the garden, and he clothed legion. And so that lets me know that it's important to God for us to be clothed. Amen? Well, I can move on now, right? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. God knows how to deliver us from our past mistakes. Malchus shouldn't have been there. But you know what? The apostle Peter shouldn't have pulled that sword out and tried to kill that man either. But I want you to look at this situation now. God was doing more here than just a miracle. Here's Malchus holding his ear, screaming. Here's the apostle Peter standing there with a sword, with blood on that edge of that sword. Here's all of those servants and those soldiers and the high priest servants. They're standing there and they're saying, oh man, well, I mean, here's Malchus screaming. And that's when Jesus, I preached that message, loose me. Jesus said, loose me and let me get to that man. Why? He wanted to heal Malchus. But not only was he wanting to heal Malchus so that he could stop the pain and stop the bleeding, but the apostle Peter's in trouble now. The apostle Peter has pulled the sword and tried to kill one of the servants of the high priest. He's in big trouble. He's in hot water now. They're going to probably hang the apostle Peter, Sister Sandra. Not only is Jesus going to heal Malchus, but he's going to take away the guilt. He's going to remove the evidence of what the apostle Peter has done. Now when Malchus goes back to the high priest and says, that man cut my ear off, they can say, what's that on your head? Oh, well, Jesus healed me. And they can say, yeah, right. Jesus knew he needed the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost to stand up and 3,000 souls would be saved. That would have never happened if Jesus had not healed his ear. I'm telling you, Jesus knows how to take care of your past. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm telling you, you can make a wreck of things. You can have your life turned upside down. But God knows wherever peace goes back. And he's able to help you if you but come to Jesus. I said he knows how to put broken pieces back together. God can help you tonight. In our minds, in our minds, we just think that we're so far away from God, but he's standing in the shadows, Brother Mushy. He wants to help us. He's concerned about the mistakes I've made, and he wants to put the broken pieces back together. And God loves you and me tonight. Amen. The Lord knoweth how to deliver from past mistakes. Amen. I went in I was witnessing in prison one day. And man, we, after we got through uh, preaching and singing, had an old guitar in there, man. Uh, There's an old boy sitting over at the table, man. He had a big old puzzle. He had a, one of them, I reckon, thousand or ten thousand piece puzzle. I don't know how many. It was a bunch of them. He was over there, and he just getting started. I went over and just sat down right beside him. Man, I mean, he had tattoos. He had a skint bald head. He had tattoos on his head, on his neck. I mean, he had, a, he had like a, a sleeveless shirt, man. He, he had more. I mean, he was muscled up. He looked like he rode with hell's angels or something. That was a rough-looking dude. I went over there and sat down at the little table, a little stainless steel table. I started talking with him about his life. I said, sir, have, have you ever been a Christian? Nah. I said, have you ever been to church? Nah. I mean, just one question after another. I said, what, what are you doing in here? How, how'd you get in here? Well, I did this and I did that. And did that. I said, well, you know, the Lord can help you. He looked up at me and he said, Lord, help me. He said, man, I, I, I've had this many wives and my home's busted up and my children don't want to talk to me and I've had this, uh, I've had this conviction and I've had that. I robbed a convenient. I mean, he just, boy, he went down the line and when he got through, I was thinking, whew, I wonder if the Lord really can help this fellow. I mean, he, oh boy, I mean, he had a list. But when he got through, Brother Albert, I was sitting there and I was thinking, man, and man, the Spirit of God just jabbed me in the heart like that. And I reached over in those puzzles and I just, what little bit he had done, I just, I just, man, I just scrambled all them pieces up. He's sitting there looking at me like I was crazy. 
And I grabbed that box. I said, what you just told me. And I said, your life is a bunch of broken, misplaced pieces. And I held the cover to that box up. And I said, God knows wherever peace goes. And I said, God can mend your past. Man, I tell you, that big old boy, he started doing like that in tears. Man, we got down on that concrete floor and prayed. I mean, the Spirit of God, I mean, God grabbed a hold of that man's heart. Let me tell you this. It don't matter where you've been, what you've done. I said, God is a God that will forgive, and he wants to help you tonight. He's concerned about you, and he can reach into yesterday, and he can help you with those problems in your life. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. The Lord knoweth how to deliver. You don't know how to do it. You don't know where the pieces go. You don't even know the next step to make in your life. But God knows how to deliver you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Woo. Amen. You know, when I got a problem, I don't know what to do. I try to find out who knows something about it. You know what I'm saying? If I got an air conditioning problem at the house, I don't find a logger to come fix the air condition. I find a HVAC man. And if I got a, a tree that needs to be taken down in the yard, I don't find a lawyer in town. I go to a tree removal service. You know what I'm saying? But I'm telling you, there ain't nobody that you can go to to help you with the problems in life but Jesus. But I said, he's good enough. He knows how to help you. I said, he's exceedingly and abundantly and above you could even ask for or even think or imagine. Hallelujah. I mean, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Glory to God. Praise God. Want somebody to come to the piano? God knows how to. To deliver you. You've got to just trust in God. I don't know how to deliver you. Mom and dad don't know how to deliver you. But God does. God knows how to turn hopeless situations around. I said God knows. I mean... When God's at his best is when you got the Red Sea on one side and Pharaoh's army on the other, Brother Tony. That's when God knows how to deliver. Who would have ever thought that the waters of that Red Sea could roll back? Nobody but God. I like to think, Brother Elbert, of them walking through that Red Sea. You ever thought about walking through that Red Sea? I thought about that the first time we ever went to the, to the, to the aquarium. I was telling Austin the other day, he said, Daddy, you never have cared me. I said, let's go walk through that tunnel, that glass tunnel. And you got the sharks swimming all around you. He said, Daddy, I don't know if I want to do that or not. They got a glass bubble down through that man, and big sharks swimming all around you. You're, just, you're on the bottom, man, looking at all them fish all around you. You ever imagine them people walking through the Red Sea, a wall of water? See one of them Nerf sharks just come up to the edge and turn back like that. I only know maybe their fin could come out the side of the water. <laughs> I don't know, but I know this. The Bible said they walked over on dry land. I said, you know, when they make movies of the Red Sea, they just cannot get it in their thick skulls what God said. It always has to be knee-deep water. But if he can roll back 40 or 50 or 60 foot, why can't God get the last 12 inches? Men just don't want to believe God fully. But I'm telling you, they kick dust when they walk across the bottom of the Red Sea. Hallelujah. Why? Because God knows how to deliver his people. Hallelujah to God. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hezekiah. You remember what King Sennacherib sent? He said, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a go in and wipe y'all clean. Y'all have had it. Old Sennacherib was bust. He was bowing his chest. I mean, he was boasting. He, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm fixing to go in there and wipe y'all up. I'm going to clean you up. You know what Hezekiah said? The Bible said Hezekiah. He brought that letter that Sennacherib had written. You know what he did with that letter? He brought it and he laid it on the altar before the Lord. 
And he said, God, this is what I'm facing. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, God could read that letter. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. Oh, yeah. I said, uh, Hezekiah didn't know what to do, Sister Sandra. He, I'm telling you, his armies wasn't big enough. He, did, he was not able. But when he carried that letter before God, I said, God proved himself that he knew how to deliver Hezekiah. He knows how to deliver Israel. And he knows how to deliver you tonight. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> 185,000 armed soldiers come against Israel. They was fixing to beat the walls down. And while they were sleeping, <laughs> God sent one angel and he killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Don't you tell me if God could send one angel and deliver them, he'll send an angel and deliver you like he did the apostle Peter out of the prison. Glory to God. The Lord knoweth how to deliver. You don't know how to deliver yourself. I don't know how to deliver my... The Lord knoweth how to deliver. Glory to God. He knoweth how to deliver hopeless out of those hopeless situations. Brother Taylor, I'm closing with this. Brother Taylor... He's got a good friend in Virginia. His name's J.A. or John A. But old John A. He had a praying mama, a woman that sought the Lord. And old John A. went off to Vietnam, served in Vietnam. And when he come back, he was hard. I mean, he was hard. John A., his mama kept praying for him, and finally, she died. John A. married, and John A.'s wife would go to church. And old John A., he would bring his wife to church, a mushy, and let her go inside. And he'd part way down on the other end up under an old oak tree. And while they was in church, he'd sit down there and drink his beer. When he'd see him start coming out the church, he'd pull up there and pick his wife up. Now, I'm talking about a man that was deep in sin. But I'm talking about a man that God changed. A man that's a good hole in this man now, solid. I mean, one of God's chosen. But he was deep in sin. And they said, one day, one of them old boys from the church asked somebody, said, what's that man doing? They said, oh, that's John A. down there. And his mother comes to church. He sits down there and drinks every service. Brother Taylor told me that John A. said, one day, one of them men out the church said when it came church time, when he got out of his car, said he didn't go into church, said he walked all the way down to the end of the parking lot, opened the door, and got in the old truck with John A. And said the whole service, he sat there and talked with John A. And said the next service, he sat there. And said the next service, he sat there. And the next, said a couple of weeks went by. And that boy was getting a burden for old John A. Drunk, sitting down on the far end of the parking lot. They said one night, that young boy out of that service told John A. said, won't you put that beer down? And let's go into church. Said John A. said, you know, I think I'll do that. Said old John A. come in the back door to church and sit down, Brother Tyrone. Something got a hold to old John A. And said he came to that altar and he gave his heart to the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said he made a good godly man. Why? Because God knows how to deliver someone from the power of the bottle. I said God knows how to deliver from the power of the needle. God knows how in a wicked and perverse generation to keep his church unspotted. God knows how to deliver. You just got to run to God. Hallelujah. But Jimmy said, oh, John A., deacon in the church now, cutting the grass. Said, oh, John A., every time he cut the church grass and he'd pass his mama's grave, they said when he'd get up there close to his mama's grave, said he'd shut that lawnmower off every time. He'd get off that old lawnmower. 
said he'd kneel down in front of that faithful mama's grave and said he'd always tell her mama, thank you for praying for me. You see, his mama knew that the Lord knew how to deliver that boy. And even when she was gone, God knew how to deliver. <laughs> you know what I'm praying, Sister Sandra? I don't know how long you're going to be here. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. But even if you have to go by the way of the grave, I'm hoping them boys will part that company truck one day, walk up to Mama's grave and say, Thank you, Mama, for praying. God knew how to deliver me. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you don't know how, but God knows how to deliver you. Every one of us. Hallelujah to God. It's too big for you. It's not too big for God. It's too great for you. It's not too great for God. He knows how to deliver his own. Hallelujah. I want us to stand in this place tonight. I want everyone, everyone that would, I want you to make your way to this altar. And let's stand around this altar. Let's kneel around this altar. And let's pray this prayer. God, deliver us from the power of darkness. Deliver us from the power of the enemy. Because God knows how to deliver us. Amen. Glory to God. Everyone that would. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. No matter where this road may lead, walking with Jesus is where I'll be.